And welcome to Entrepreneurship Hour, Entrepreneurship 407, our final class. It's good to have you here. Um, before we get started, I just want to show you something really quickly. One of the greatest gymnasts in the United States. 13 All-American honors, five NCAA titles. He needs a 14-1-5 to tie Modi. Sam gets a 14-1-5 when he turns his alarm clock off in the morning. Hello, Sam McCulloch, Nicholas Hunter, any of the rest of the gymnastics team. Are you guys here? Yeah. All right. Congratulations to winning the U.S. National Championship for the gymnastics. And Sam, your role to that. That's a pretty big deal, and uh, we're all proud of you. Congratulations. Hey, this is going to be a great class. Um, I want to introduce to you someone that I admire a lot. He's the executive director of the Center for Entrepreneurship, Tom Frank, and he's going to be introducing to you uh, a local entrepreneur and investor in entrepreneurs here in Ann Arbor, Mark Weiser. So let's, without any further ado, have Tom Frank. Come on out. Tom. There's nothing like following somebody who just accomplished something in 30 seconds that's more spectacular than anything I will do for the rest of my life. So thanks for that intro, Dave. Um, today is a special day because the person that I'm going to bring out on stage uh, is about as much of a Michigan man of anybody you could hope to meet. Mark Weiser has degrees from both engineering and Ross, and like many of you hope to do, uh, shortly upon graduation, he went west, he joined a startup. Lucky for all of us, at a certain point, Mark came home again. And Mark is one of the venture capitalists who has been instrumental, or dare I say critical, in the significant influx of venture capital in the state of Michigan, which is outpacing many other regions today. More importantly, in all likelihood, there may not even be an Entrepreneurship 407 class were it not for Mark's involvement in the creation of this center. So we'll take a few minutes to let him tell you that part of the story. But ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mark Weiser. I guess I don't get the big boy mic anymore. So. Can you talk a little bit about the formation of the Center for Entrepreneurship since you were on that visionary committee that helped create it, this center and what your thoughts were and why you thought it was important? Yeah, uh, so when I was an undergrad here, there were myself and one other guy who, who got a company public out of the, my class in the engineering school and the other guy's name was Larry Page. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is, I got out first, so that, that means I win. <laughs> um, who cares how big Google is? First is best. Um, but uh, no one ever spoke to either of us about the notion of entrepreneurship when we were in the College of Engineering. And if you look today at what's going on, most entrepreneurship is driven from people who are engineering or engineering-minded, don't have to necessarily be engineers, but are looking at how you solve difficult problems and taking those same skills that they might use to solve a technical problem and applying it to human problems. And so 
when I looked at the College of Engineering uh, over the years, uh, there still just wasn't really a discussion going on. And, and I thought it was important for the students to be engaged in that discussion. And as I started to talk to the university uh, and to the dean here at the College of Engineering, we started to realize there was a, a tremendous opportunity with the students who were here. So the focus of the CFE from the very get-go was always the students, and it still continues to be that today. So um, it's, about, it's about you guys. That's what the CFE is here for. And another, uh, another operation here that you were very involved in help getting off the ground uh, was TechArb, which is our incubator. And I believe uh, Jason Bornhorst was a speaker for the class this year, Dave? Everybody remember Jason? Um, maybe you could tell a few tales out of school about uh, you and Jason getting a tech arb up and off the ground. Uh, it, it, it involved a lot of beer. Uh, it involved uh, carrying lots of heavy uh, furniture because we found free furniture wherever we could. Uh, but um, you know, the, the tech arb was based upon the notion that you can learn a bunch of stuff in class. You can see a bunch of entrepreneurs come to the entrepreneurship hour and talk about what it is that they've done in their lives to be successful entrepreneurs. But without going out and doing it, there really is no way to, to truly learn about entrepreneurship. And, and we, we always sort of defined it as uh, see one, which is see an entrepreneur here, uh, teach one, which is go into class or go into the practicum and then and do one. And then actually that's start a, a company or join a startup. And Tuckarb was that, that pinnacle of, okay, you're ready to go start it. How do you go do it? Where do you go? Where can you get resources? And so uh, Jason had come to me after the first year of TechArb, which was actually called RPM10. It was just three teams. Um, and said, hey, look, we've got a bunch of other people who didn't get grants from you guys who want to start companies. Can, can we get it started? And we found some space and got the free furniture and carried it in it late at night. And uh, next thing we know, we're on uh, national television and everybody's thinking that this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And we're just wondering, hey, uh, can someone start paying for the furniture and the beer besides me, so. We're still working on that. Um, you're here today because your firm gives out awards on an annual basis for both undergraduate and graduate entrepreneurs of the year. Talk a little bit about why that's important to you. So when you're a student entrepreneur, uh, unless you're in one of the, the classes that's involved directly with the certificate if you're an undergrad, or you're, you're getting the master's in entrepreneurship, um, there is no credit for spending a bunch of time starting a company. Um, there is no credit for working on a startup. Uh, you get a ton of, of, of knowledge out of it, and you learn a lot for yourself, but you know, recognizing that, I think, is um, uh, incredibly important because it helps build the community. In fact, for those of you who are paying attention uh, about 36 hours ago, I had this bright idea that I'd also try and recognize the entrepreneurial student organizations on campus. Uh, and I thought, okay, let's see how much they can engage their community. So the awards are about recognizing somebody who's been engaged in entrepreneurship so that it has, a re they reflect well on the community. The community can see that there's a reason to go do this. They can see that there's somebody who's actually out there and successful. Uh, and, it, and it's not so much about the, the monetary award as it is the recognition that hey, somebody's gone and worked really hard to do something unusual as a student in starting a business, whether it's, it's a for-profit or it's a social entrepreneurial pursuit. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's just as important in community building to have, have examples of what people have been doing that have been successful uh, as it is to, to actually go do it yourself. So um, that's why we do the award, and that's why we're now adding in the student group. And in fact, for those of you that haven't seen, uh, Empowered will be getting $1,000 uh, as, as part of the, the experiment here. And, and more importantly, there's two other student groups, Michigan, Tamid, and, and uh, Nexicon, both which were started at U of M as well. Uh, and one of them now is actually at multiple universities. And because they did such a good job, I'm going to give $500 to each of them as well. So. You should talk for just a second about what, how you set this up, what the challenge was, how Empowered got their $1,000 award. Sure. So, I, again, you know, when you think about it, an entrepreneurial community, and, and for those of you, who here knows who Brad Feld is or heard of Jason Mendelson or heard of Boulder, for that matter, right? So there's a lot of talk about how you take someplace besides Silicon Valley and build an entrepreneurial community. And um, Ann Arbor is one of those places, and a lot of it is actually driven by the students. 
So I wanted to see if there was a way to get these entrepreneurial student organizations to engage their community. And just a, a brief experiment to see, hey, can we, can we get a group of people to do something really quickly and move fast? And uh, I think we had 200 votes in the last 36 hours, which is not too bad. Not too bad. Speaking of not too bad, let's, uh, let's get a taste of this year's award winners. I will tell you that this is the first year that I've been here for this process, uh, but it was a great treat deciding on both the undergraduate and graduate winners. The reason why it was a treat is because I had so many excellent candidates to choose from. And in fact, uh, the decision process was so tough that I invented a new category of awards that the CFE will be giving out in a few weeks because I just couldn't stand to not give out more awards to some of the deserving entrepreneurs. But I've known Mark for a short while, but well enough to know that I better pick the best for him. So, um, at the undergraduate level today, um, please welcome Carrie Chapman. We're going to let Carrie do her pitch in just a second, but um, the reason, or one of the reasons of many why Kiri was selected for this award is because aside from the fact that she identified a need, she created a product, and that she is trying to bring that product to market, which we all know is what entrepreneurs do, uh, I have yet to meet anyone in our brilliant community here with as much enthusiasm and determination and follow-up skills, some might say pestering, but follow-up skills to see that she can get her idea and her project to the next level. So Carrie embodies everything that I love in an entrepreneur, which is an optimism and a determination that sometimes even trumps reality, but uh, is guaranteed to help make sure that she's a success. So congratulations, Carrie. Let's hear what you're all about. Congratulations. that I felt and a lot of my friends felt as well. And um, it all started with a point shoe. So I started my career as a professional ballet dancer and my shoes were always falling apart, slipping off the back of my heels. And I would always try to fix them, sew them, put an elastic on the back. And my friends called them Franken shoes because they were always so manipulated and uh, torn apart. And I found that if I put an elastic at the back of the shoe, as I went on point, they wouldn't slip and they wouldn't give me blisters on the back of my heel. And so I started looking around and noticed that it wasn't just a dancer's problem. It was a problem that a lot of women face and a lot of men, um, more women than men. But these are all of the products that already exist to try to address this problem, but they weren't addressing them in the correct way. It was an efficient solution. So uh, I created this product, which is a little strap that I originally sewed onto the back of a point shoe and put it onto an insole so that you could put it into any shoe. And this is how it works. So. Uh, we've started to our customer discovery and we've interviewed over a hundred women, um, colleagues, friends, dancers, working women, and we found that about 60% of these women had this same pain. They have slipping heels, they have blisters in the back of their feet, um, not comfortable, and nearly all of them wanted to find a better solution. So the solutions that exist just push your foot forward, making the shoe even smaller and making it even more uncomfortable. So we thought we had a market. Um, I've been working with some people from the Ross Business School trying to develop a business strategy and we've tried to focus the next one year on developing the product so we, we have this product to give out and then also to develop some distribution channels in local shoe stores in southeast Michigan and we think that we have an addressable market of about three million dollars a year if we can really get our act together and, and start small with two million dollars annual sales in the southeast Michigan area. We are patent pending, so we got a jumpstart grant from the CFE to um, write the provisional patent application and kind of protect our idea as we move forward, so I just want to thank the CFE for that. Um, one of the things that we'd like to do for our marketing campaign is to bring 
the product to the Latin dance festivals that myself and the competitive bachata team that I coach, who are here tonight and you'll see them dance, um, are a part of. So we travel all around the country, all around the world. Um, we're invited to all sorts of different Latin dance congresses and, and events um, to perform, to teach, and to get to know, to, to social dance with all the other dancers. Um, it's, it's a huge market, it's a growing market. These, these festivals attract thousands of professional and amateur dancers, and there are already products that have launched based on the, um, the su success they've had with, um, with a launch through this, this channel. One of the, the products that's been a huge success is a company called Berju Shoes, and they launched at Latin Dance Festivals, and now their shoes are everywhere. They have fashion shows, catwalks, all the Dancing with the Stars dancers wear these shoes. On the marketing cam campaign, we want to be grassroots, so the, the Latin dance team, Alma, Alma Latina Detroit, will be the brand ambassadors, bringing this product to um, Latin dance festivals first, because we know that the dancers are an extremely discerning audience, and we feel like if we can get them to wear our product, they dance all night hard in their shoes, and if they can wear this product, then we think that um, anybody else can too. This is Alma Detroit. Um, after we develop our market, we'd like to get it into shoes from specialty shoes like dance shoes to running shoes to um, the insert that we've created. Um, right now we're prototyping a lot and I actually have a gift for Mark Weiser as well. Last night we were at um, Makerworks where they let us use all their machines and I'm now certified on a CNC router. So this is for you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we think that retailers will be happy to carry our product because one size fits all. It's a small unit. Um, our margins are high. It's a very small amount of material. Um, it's, it's easy to ship. It's easy to carry in your stores. We need just a small um, wall space to hang a couple of these, and, and we think that everybody could use a pair. These are some of the people on my team, um, as well as some people sitting in the audience, Dan Rice, and then if Alma Latina will come on up, we're just going to dance for you guys. They're wearing the prototypes in their shoes, and um, you'll see that they can, they can dance well in them. <laughs> Ya no puedo seguir viviendo de recuerdos Tomaré mi equipaje y emprenderé un vuelo Buscaré la mujer que hace vibrar mi cuerpo La que me hace soñar, la que me eleva al cielo Y no sé cómo haces para volverme loco Qué magia tú tienes para hacer el amor Me envuelves en un mundo distinto y ya no soy el mismo cuando contigo estoy Y no sé cómo haces para volverme loco Qué magia tú tienes para hacer el amor Me envuelves en un mundo distinto Y ya no soy el mismo cuando contigo estoy oh, 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 oh. I felt bad about following the gymnastic champions, but now I feel really bad for our graduate team winners. It's hard to follow the Latin dancers. Just in case you're wondering how big the market is, um, you guys probably don't want to see this, but that is uh, the Heavenly Heels pad, and it's terrible. It is, it is bad, it's terrible. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to wear extra thick socks, even though it's warm outside, to keep these shoes. Now you won't have to anymore. No, I won't have to. Right. I was hoping you would give me a prototype. <laughs> Prototypes, the real prototypes are coming mm -hmm. right. now that we can see them. Through. I think we can cut that deal for Mark, can't we? Definitely. Yeah. Early adopter. Mm -hmm. Moving on to our graduate team, um, we didn't pick one winner, we picked uh, a team because there was a team 
uh, that's studying in our Masters of Entrepreneurship program that embodies another important aspect of entrepreneurship here, which is the challenge of translational research. How do you take something that seems complex in the lab, very hard, and turn it into a product and a market and understand all of the chutes and ladders that go along with that process. I will tell you, candidly, that some of you may not understand all of the details that come with the slide deck for Team Elegus. That's because there are so many brain cells collectively between these team members that you cannot possibly contain them on a slide. Dare I say, it explodes off the page. But I want to welcome them up here to talk a little bit about who they are and what they do and why we thought that they should be this year's winners for our Graduate RPM Venture Award. Team Elegus. Do you want Mark and I to maybe sway in the background since That's you guys are the yeah. dancers? We don't. Um, yeah. We didn't bring any dancers, so I hope you guys. <laughs> I hope you still like us. Um, yeah. Make sure this works the right way. Okay. So uh, we're Elegus. Elegus Technologies. Uh, this is Long, Dan, I'm John. The three of us are, you know, like the intro in the Master of Entrepreneurship program, and uh, we're just gonna have a nice conversation about our progress. You know, it's been a tough couple of months, but. Certainly, we have some products to show you and uh, a, a good stepping stone to jump to soon. So if you don't know what a lithium-ion battery is, I'm sure most of you have heard of it, but I'm sure you contain or at least own a device that runs on one of them, a smartphone or a laptop. Maybe you know of a power drill that runs on it. I'm sure you may even follow electric vehicles. You know, there's this big trend to um, increasing the amount of lithium-ion batteries on the market for electric vehicles. Um, but if you don't know about that, you probably might know that there's problems with them still. Uh, maybe your laptop gets hot on your lap or your smartphone gets hot in your pocket. The two key issues with lithium-ion batteries is their thermal instability and uh, their mechanical properties. And it's an issue still unsolved. You can see that's the result of the Boeing 787, which was a lithium-ion battery. And uh, we make a very small membrane that goes in between the cathode and anode. And I have a schematic up there. You can see what the separator is. It's a tiny film that acts um, as an insulator and a conductor. So our solution addresses the thermal instabilities and the mechanical instabilities. We derive our film from Kevlar. You can see uh, an example of a bulletproof vest up there. We uh, dissolve large-scale Kevlar fibers into a nanofiber form, and the resulting film uh, is very strong and, and can resist high temperatures. You can see the Kevlar spool up there. I don't know if this is a pointer on it, but the spool up there and the solution in the red is the resulting um, dissolution of those fibers. Uh, we've done significant um, R&D, uh, early stage R&D. This has been a lab for over four years, and uh, we have extremely competitive thermal properties, mechanical properties, and electrochemical. There's a lot of jargon up here. Tom kind of gave the preface. Um, just know that there's a lot of green check marks, and that's good. And uh, <laughs> we, are, we are far and away better than, um, or at least orders of magnitude better in certain tests and certain parameters than any industry leader we find, in this case, compared to CellGuard, which is made of a different property, or different uh, material. Okay, so competition. Um, it's a pretty dense market with a lot of players and separators in the market. But generally, there are only two types, two types of uh, separators, the uh, older generation and the newer generation. And the older generation one is pretty cheap, but they don't solve the fire issue as, bad, as good as the newer ones. Um, so Elegus comes into the market with a really good position because we are manufacturing the better ones that can solve the fire issues better, but we can manufacture our membranes at a lower cost, which uh, is going to kick ass, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the picture on the top is our uh, final product, and no, it's not toilet paper. Uh, it's actually rolls of separator that we're going to send to the actual battery manufacturers. And the battery manufacturer will cut this separator into pieces and put them 
into the battery to make the actual cell. And the picture on the bottom you can see is the manufacturing process that we're looking into. It's called doctor blading for mass production of our separator. And it's gonna give us a consistent property among the membranes that we're manufacturing. So we've done customer uh, discovery. Uh, it's a very important part of any entrepreneurial uh, endeavor is to find out if you have a customer and how many exactly you have. Uh, so we have talked to over 60 battery, battery manufacturers. Uh, 18 of them we consider really good uh, key customers. Um, of those, 10 have already asked us, could we please get samples, put them in our uh, batteries and test them. Um, right now we're working with one of the local labs here in Ann Arbor. Uh, it's Novitas, or you may have heard of A123 batteries. And uh, they are taking our samples and going to be testing, collecting data on our behalf. And as soon as those tests are done, we're going to release those samples. Uh, to the rest of uh, the 60 customers. So our market, right, you need to be able to sell to someone. Uh, it's a very large market for battery separators. Right now it's a $1.3 billion market, and it's going to expand to a $4.7 billion market in 2020. Now, our battery separators, like you saw on uh, long slide, uh, have really good thermal properties. And what that means is that the batteries can now work up to 300 degrees instead of the 100 degrees or 80 degrees before, uh, which means that you can use them in interesting places that you can never take batteries before. You can take them on uh, military flights, or you can take them uh, in deep down into the ground when you drill. So there's a huge market for drilling and for other applications that require high temperature. And uh, that's a $50 million market today, but it's going to be a $190 million market by 2020. So we did our financials, also something you have to do if you're running a business. And uh, right now, 2014, 2015, we're receiving a lot of grants and government funding uh, to continue with our research. And in 2016, you see the numbers jump quite largely. Uh, we are setting up a manufacturing plant here in Wayne County uh, or Washtenaw County. And we uh, plan on producing uh, in 2016, moving into 2017, 2018, we'll be making actual battery separators and getting them out of the hands of our customers. So there's the three of us. There's uh, John, he has experience in management. He has run a, a business here. Uh, Long, he is an electrical engineer. And I'm Dan, I do uh, automotive safety. Uh, and we also have two other team members, uh, Sue Ann, who is a PhD research student here in the Kotov lab and a co-inventor of this uh, new battery separator technology, as well as our primary uh, investigator, which is uh, Dr. Nicholas Kotov. And as you can see, he's done some amazing, uh, over 20 patents, 230 papers, uh, a lot of uh, great work. So we're happy that we got a chance to present to you today, and we look forward to see your ideas coming from CFE in the future. Thank you. We're going to do a little Q&A. What? Sorry, I don't get two mics. Um, first question is, uh, maybe you guys can tell us how you're going to use Mark's money this summer. <laughs> Pass. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I can go first. So uh, something that didn't make its way into the PowerPoint is um, kind of our developmental road and a significant milestone to reach for us. And we're at this inflection point of testing. Um, it's a necessity for us to uh, meet some of the tests that you know 80% of our customers want to see. And uh, this partnership we have with Navitas is uh, crucial because they have laid out you know, um, eight core tests for us to do, and we know how much it costs, and this is something that needs to be done uh, quickly for us to get the samples in the hands of the customers. So um, the funding we have right now, um, a little over $10,000, uh, as well as some funding coming in from other sources will go directly towards the testing that needs to be done. That's great. Kerry, I know you've been racking up prizes at everything I've been judging, so I'm guessing you're going on a cruise. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I'm actually going to be going to MakerWorks a lot more, so we really need to get real prototypes made. All of the prototypes that um, Alma Latina was wearing, uh, my mom and I made in the kitchen, so we're going to try to get some more professional prototypes made. Um, I'm also going to be prototyping with urethanes with Larry Armbruster, who Rich Sheridan kind of hooked me up with. And... Um, He's going to come down in a couple weeks and mix some urethanes for us and uh, pour some molds. Dave, this is your class. Should we open it up for questions from your students? Sure. Does anybody have any questions for anybody on the team? 
Shout it out. It's hard to see into the dark. <laughs> oh, well, it, the, it, it can be used in other power sources. We're right now just exploring lithium ion batteries. This membrane can be possibly used in supercapacitors and fuel cells, but right now the most pressing need and the best fit is as a lithium ion membrane with that um, chemistry. But it's something we can explore, and we have um, explored the possibility of other markets, but right now we're going to do the one that's best fit for our value proposition. Can I ask by a show of hands, um, how many people who took this class have an idea or an interest in starting a venture while they're here at the university who are more or less encouraged, hands up or down, now that you've been through the experience of Entrepreneurship Hour? Okay, well then we'll expect to see all of you come through the CFE in the next six months. Um, other questions for our winners? Who's going to be next year's winner by a show of hands? There you go. Dave? I have a question for the winners. Go for it. So um, I know for the graduate students, you were part of, part of the master's in entrepreneurship program, so this was part of the, the class. But what kept you guys, for both of you all, what kept you all working on this despite the fact that you're still getting a degree and you're still in school? Yeah, it was hard to balance both. Um, I'm in the School of Music, Theater, and Dance. I'm doing my dance BFA. And sometimes they don't understand what I'm doing with the Center for Entrepreneurship. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but um, I think all of the different programs, um, the Weather Underground Startup Trek was a really um, important part of growing Heal Secret and, and the people that I've met along the way, it's just been so much fun. Um, we have people from the business school, an MD, PhD, some engineers, all these people, I'm learning so much. And um, I think mostly just the people and, and the different events that have brought us together to keep pushing forward. So uh, I think for us, you know, I, I don't want to say the same things, but, um, a great team kind of keeps it together. These, I love working these, with these two guys. Um, probably the best team I've been a part of. And uh, on top of you know, the great technical staff behind us, it's rare you get a chance to possibly commercialize something coming from a research university like this with a PI uh, that we have. Um, besides that, I can probably speak for Dan and myself and Long. And we've been out in industry and working for firms and uh, I know Dan did 10 years and probably doesn't want to go back and I you know lasted eight months at a company that I probably should have lasted eight days at so I think for us we enjoy the day-to-day -day unknowns and I'm sure that's why everyone is in here they enjoy the day-to-day -day unknowns and um, you know applying no really stagnant skill set but a, a never-changing skill set to um, to make something that's of value. And so that's, I think, what keeps us going every day. And an opportunity for another commercial. Where will um, your team be spending the summer? Our team, oh, yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll be at TechArb. Uh, huh. I, I, we learned we're going to be one of the incumbents, or no, sorry, the incoming teams going to TechArb, which will be great to have a physical location. And uh, yeah, thank you. Hey, Mark, you evaluate pitches all the time, right? And so uh, do you have some feedback for these two on their pitch and, and their core business idea? Sure. Um, so uh, which order we, should we go in here? Let's start closest to you and work out. OK, so uh, there's two things I can tell you right away. So first of all, um, and I don't, don't want to offend the students you worked with at Ross in case they're in here, <laughs> but you're thinking way too small. Yeah. Right? This is much bigger. I think very smart that you're finding a niche to go after to own in the dance market, going after it quickly, using guerrilla tactics. But this strikes me as this should be a Kickstarter campaign. This is the kind of thing that um, you can probably engage 51% uh, of the population of the United States on in, in short order. Because I'm guessing that, uh, as you pointed out, there are plenty of women who buy shoes that can't get them to fit perfectly, and this allows them to fit perfectly. So. Thinking about just Southeast Michigan and the opportunity to distribution here, I think in, in the tools that are available to you for distribution on the internet, doing direct distribution, um, your first channel should be going after as much of the United States or Canada or the world as you can, and Kickstarter is a great way to get that started. And then distribution will occur as you start to get product into market because 
people who sell shoes, people who are uh, in that market will start finding you. And that's one of the great things that, that all of you have as, a, as tools available to you today that makes this a golden era of entrepreneurship. Is 10 years ago, even with the web, it was really tough to get that kind of attention. Today, you can get that kind of attention quickly, especially in a niche like this. So I, I think your, your idea is great. The, the execution you've had on it so far is great. I think your plans need to be much bigger. Um, there is an architect uh, from, uh, uh, who, who designed most of Chicago names, Daniel Burnham. And Sam Zell, if anybody knows the name Zell, who's also a Michigan alumni, who's an entrepreneur, is fond of actually, to think it's his favorite quote, which is make no small plans. Um, and so I think thinking bigger. And then uh, for, for Elegus, uh, I think uh, clearly the, the challenge is, is the lithium ion market is a noisy market. So, um, you know, you talked about being able to go into places where there's a high temperature problem. Um, I would, as you're figuring out your manufacturing, and I know you're looking at some mass production techniques, et cetera, and you're going to test it, I would go as quickly as possible and find somebody who has an immediate pain now who you know, not just shipping to 60 people, but somebody who will pay you now. Because in markets where you have, where you have um, uh, a, a material and you're, you're making a better mousetrap, as it were, if there's somebody who has the pain, they'll pay you right now. Um, and I wouldn't wait to go and test with 60 people and all the other stuff. Once you know it works, I'd, get, I'd make it your mission to find that one customer and get it deployed in as many places as possible. Or get it, sorry, to get it deployed with them as deeply as possible. And then you can step back and look at deploying it in more places. All right, so a, a question for you two. High mm -hmm. and the low, mm -hmm. okay? So you're, you're, you're developing these products. Mm -hmm. It's just the day you're like, wow, this is great, and the day that's low. I think um, the highest points have been um, the Weather Underground Startup Trek, Obviously, receiving this award is a huge honor. Um, the M tank pitch. Um, the lowest points were um, making the prototypes in my kitchen with my mom, and uh, it wasn't working, and I was getting frustrated. So thanks, mom, for coming to help me with the prototyping process and, and telling me that it was going to be OK. <laughs> Same question? Yeah. The highs and the lows? Yeah. OK. So I can probably say the lows pretty quickly. Um, there's been a lot of them. So um, one of the biggest. Do we have time. No, <laughs> no. no. So, Ten more minutes at least. What's nice about the program is we get a lot of practice pitching, and uh, some of our worst pitches have been to you know seasoned veterans like Mark. And you know you come in with this pitch that's all prepared, and we think it's awesome, and then they really kind of destroy it and. They're really mean people, and it really hurts because we put all this work into a PowerPoint. Wow, look at the time. I can see class is over. Wow, that 10 minutes went by fast. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's not all bad because, you know, on the flip side, we, you learn so much about, you know, why your um, vision of it, and you have to get outside your head and see how they saw it, and uh, it's just a learning moment. It, it's, it's, I think it's love, but it's always tough love, and that's kind of, there's a lot of love in the room, but it's really tough, and that's been our, our low points. Um, Nothing but love. For, <laughs> for the, besides the high points, you know, when we learn about how bad we're doing, uh, <laughs> we've, I think one of the, the biggest tips for us that we learned this year um, was the, the transition from asking for permission to asking for forgiveness, and we've had a lot of interesting and fun stories when we were working or like in school as an undergrad, a lot of times you have to check if you can do something or maybe send an email. And now it's very different. We'll just pick up a phone and call. And I think that's a very important distinction when you start having the mindset of, well, just do it. And if it goes wrong, then ask for forgiveness. And one of the things during customer discovery was we needed to call this company. And I, it was like nine o'clock on a Wednesday and I saw the cell phone for the CEO of one of our biggest competitors. And probably undergrad John would have just emailed and tried to figure out a time to talk, but I just called him and he answered and we talked for about 20 minutes and I just got a lot of info from him and I didn't expect that, but that's kind of what happens. And those have been the fun kind of high points where stories like that. So this is the last class for entrepreneurship 407 this semester. 
I want to thank each of you for your participation. I want to thank Tom Frank for all you're doing with the Center for Entrepreneurship and the rest of the entrepreneurial community. The Ross uh, Zellurie Institute is represented by uh, the uh, dual Master of Entrepreneurship program. Thank you uh, both uh, students for the incredible uh, re representation that you have of a great entrepreneurial student community here. And Mark, for what you started seven years ago, thank you for being here and uh, keeping it going. Everyone? Have a good final rest of the semester. Take care.